Go ahead for me, Melissa. Okay, sir. Jason Haynes is a barrister at law and solicitor in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, an attorney at law in Barbados, who is currently a lecturer and deputy dean at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. He was previously employed as a senior legal officer at the Brit British High Commission, Bridgetown Barbados. Jason obtained his Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of the West Indies, UWE, Cave Hill Campus Barbados, the Master of Laws degree from the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom, and the Doctor of Philosophy, PhD in Law from Durham University, United Kingdom. He is a fellow of the UK Higher Education Authority, having previously taught law at Durham University and the UWE Mona Campus, Jamaica. He is a former National Scholarship recipient from the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, a former British Chevening Scholarship recipient, and a former Commonwealth Scholarship recipient. All right. Thank you very much, Melissa. Welcome, Dr. Haynes. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Mr. Hall. Good uh, morning, Melissa, and thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Uh, good morning, students of Caribbean Studies. Uh, it is good to be with you this morning. Um, the last time I did Caribbean Studies was in 2008. Subjects at Cape. And I very much hope that you've been having a good year so far, despite the challenges of COVID-19 and that as you prepare for your upcoming exams, you're in good frame of mind, um, not to withstanding the fact that, you know, lots is happening at the moment. Um, there's so many challenges that you're being confronted with um, as students, as regular members of society. Um, and I very much hope that um, notwithstanding these challenges, you are optimistic, you're hopeful, and of course you will be completing in your CAPE um, program, I'm sure. Um, these guys are in second year CAPE, is it? Or you're in first year? Are you in first or second year of sixth form? Second year, sir. Oh, second year. Okay, all righty. No, it was just that um, when I did CAPE um, slash Cambridge exams in St. Vincent um, several years ago, uh, we didn't have exams at the end of the individual units. So for example, I mean, I did computer science um, and we did both of the units for CAPE in the second year. Um, similarly for Caribbean studies, we did it for the second year um, and several others as well. So we don't do um, examinations by units so that you do a unit in first year and then you do one in some way because you are more um, academically advanced in terms of your uh, understanding of the subject matter after two years as opposed to doing one unit after a year. But at the same time, it is very challenging because it's two years of work and if you're balancing four or five um, CAPE subjects or levels, it can be quite difficult to, to balance. But good to hear that you guys are almost at the end. All right, so Mr. Hall has asked me uh, to speak to you this morning. So social justice has been a big topic in the media, um, in academia, in politics, in economics, and in several other spheres of life. It is a term that has been bandied about and really and truly it's a term that has many conceptions, many um, understandings, uh, many different opinions and viewpoints as to exactly what it means. So perhaps I can hear from you first, hear the word social justice. What do you think of? And it'd be great hearing one or two of you. I mean, I'm sure some of you are planning to do law. Uh, I teach law at the Faculty of Law at the Cave Hill campus. Um, and 
every year I have hundreds of students and students are very engaged. They participate and the expectation is that you get a taste of what the university setting might very well be like. Um, I would hear from you and that we'll have a discussion or conversation rather than I just, you know, I'm giving a lecture. So when you hear the term social justice, what do you think about? What is your concept of social justice? Do you think that we should be concerned about social justice? Does it matter? Yes, sir, it does matter. All right, so it certainly does matter. Uh, so what are some of the elements do you think of social justice? When you hear of social justice, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Well, and again, I think because, of, yes? Oh, I think of everyone, everyone's rights being fulfilled. Everyone having the freedom of right. freedom of opportunities, as someone said in the group, Emily. Absolutely. Okay, yes. So I heard rights, I heard opportunities being created as well for persons throughout the length and breadth of society. I heard also just reading a chat of equality. And yes, all of those things constitute social justice. All right, there's not a singular concept of social justice. It has many different strands and many different understandings. Um, I, th I, th I thought I saw Jamelia, is it, um, a while ago, who wanted to perhaps chime in here to say something? All right. Um, Shelly, I see in the chat that you've written that social justice is about striving to attend to the needs and rights of citizens. And indeed, you are very much on point. So the traditional understanding of social justice is that as a society, we have an obligation and it's an implied obligation to our fellow men, people who are both in an advantageous position, but also people who are not in an advantageous position. So the rich, the poor, the in-between, we have an obligation to ensure that these individuals are treated equally, they're treated fairly, they're respected, and their rights are advanced and protected. So when we talk about social justice, we are not privileging any particular sector of society. Instead, what we're aiming to do is to recognize that all individuals by virtue of having been born a human being have certain rights, certain interests that are to be protected and that these individuals must be respected. Now, there are different conceptions of this notion of social justice. In other words, there are theorists who take very different approaches when defining social justice. Some focus on social justice from the perspective of natural rights. And we'll get to the point as to what natural rights entail in a short while from now. But others also focus on this notion of social justice being a welfare issue, or it's about provision of welfare services, all right? And still, there are others who are not really concern about welfare that much, they are concerned about mutual advantage. And again, we'll get to what those things mean in a bit from now. So let's start with the traditional conception of social justice being a natural rights phenomenon. Now, those people who believe in, 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 in social justice as being a natural rights phenomenon speak of every individual having God-given rights. In other words, by virtue of being a human being, you are, as soon as you're born, equipped with certain rights which are considered inalienable. In other words, they are intrinsic to you as a human being, and you should be afforded those rights, irrespective of where you were born and into which circumstances you were born. So it is concerned with this idea that individuals by virtue of being human beings have the right to life, have the right to liberty, have the right to dignity. It is concerned not only with the protection of individuals' civil rights. So your right to life, your right to uh, liberty, 
your right to security, your right to free movement, but it's also concerned with your right to have certain economic and social considerations in your favor. So, for example, the right to land um, or own property, uh, the right to health and well-being, the, well, the right to work as such. And so what you have at the international level, and in some instances also in our constitutions, is a recognition of these rights. They're classed on the one hand as civil and political rights, but they also can be classed in, in another way as uh, economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, the truth is, in our societies in the Caribbean and in Jamaica in particular, there is a much more focus on civil and political rights. So the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to security, the right to freedom of association, the right to vote, etc. Those are civil and political rights. But there's less focus on economic, social, and cultural rights. So the right to a healthy environment, for example, there's not much emphasis on that in the region. There's not much emphasis also on the right to health, uh, the right to sustainable development, um, the right to uh, work. All of these things are considered socio or social legal, uh, sorry, social, um, economic, economic, social, and cultural rights. Um, and unfortunately, they have not developed um, as uh, civil and political rights have developed. Uh, not that they are less important, but society had to fight its battle and choose its battle. And governments traditionally have chosen to fight the battle of providing for our basic rights, our civil and political rights. And they have seen, therefore, economic, social, and cultural rights as an adjunct. In other words, something just a bit on the side but not as important as the political and civil rights. Now, when we talk about human rights in the context of this notion of social justice, we are talking about international instruments which recognize and protect these rights. For example, the rights of women are protected by the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Similarly, the rights of the child are protected by the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The rights of persons with disabilities, they are protected by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Now, there are instances in which international law would have been passed in order to address some of the atrocities that are faced in the world. So think, for example, of genocide, so mass executions or killing of individuals without them going through a proper process of courtroom administration of having their cases appropriately dealt with. That is an instance of genocide. There could also be crimes against humanity, such as slavery and servitude, and these types of very cruel and inhumane treatment, they are dealt with by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So what you have then is a universal recognition, which began with the Declaration on the Rights of Man, or the United Nations Human Rights Declaration of 1948, which recognized these inalienable rights. In other words, these rights which are born as human beings. And part of the rhetoric regarding social justice in the context of these um, international instruments which I prefer to provide for, is that there must be equality of treatment that men and women, for example, should be treated equally because one gender is not less placed than the other. There's a recognition as well that these individuals across uh, racial boundaries or barriers, nothing really separates them except the color of their skin. And therefore they should be treated equally. Persons who are suffering from a disability or who have a disability, um, they're not less than anybody else. Children are not less than anybody else. They are not property. They're people equally and that their best interest must be protected. 
And so that is the conception of social justice, which exists in many of our jurisdictions. Now, as you might imagine, in countries in the Caribbean, which have very few resources and which have to then strive to maintain an equilibrium in terms of the distribution of resources, especially to those persons who are in a vulnerable position. Questions often arise as to which rights do you prioritize in situations when you have very little resources? Do you prioritize the right of an individual for that individual to work or the right to provide sanitation for that individual, such as water, uh, clothing, food, et cetera? Do you prioritize the, the, the opportunity to gain an education? Do you prioritize the opportunity to participate in social and cultural events? Do you prioritize the protection of the environment? Um, do you prioritize the healthcare system? So these are competing interests which governments frequently face. And it is not easy if you are in a political position to which you've been appointed to address these matters because they mean that you have to make some very hard decisions as to what in your view is most important to your community. And I just wanted to feel from you in terms of um, you know, your response, what types of rights or which rights would you say in the Jamaican context is given more prominence or importance. When you look at the media stories, when you um, listen to political rallies, when you look at the general workings of your society, what do you see as the important rights that have been prioritized? And what have you been seeing as those lesser important rights in your society or around you? Any thoughts on that? Feel free to chime in. It's a safe space. Yes, uh, Shereen, go ahead, please. Good day again, sir. Well, I was looking at it and at first, at a first glance, I was like, I don't see them prioritizing any rights. But okay. then looking, looking a bit closer, I guess they don't pay attention to, um, well, they don't give much attention to I, th I think healthcare, I don't think healthcare is like okay. on the top of the list, but okay. I, I see them trying to give us work opportunities and, you know, but I don't see them giving much attention to one specific one, probably just a broad spread, but okay. not a good spread. All right. Spread. All right. Fair enough. A good point there, yeah, Serene. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Candice. Okay, good morning, Mr. Haynes. Um, mm -hmm. In Jamaica, there is definitely an emphasis on voting and the right that everyone should vote. You know, yes. very, very political. Um, yes. But there isn't much until like recent times into the rights of children and women, especially right. with mm -hmm. the violence that goes on, like domestic violence and stuff like that. So there's definitely a growing uh emphasis on oh, yes. political um rights rather than social and civic rights absolutely very much on point and you know i've been watching the news like you have and you've seen the numerous incidents in which women have been subject um, to various forms of cruelty in humanity. Um, women who are being kidnapped, women who are being slaughtered on a daily basis. And the response of the government has not always been um, well-founded. Um, we've seen, in addition, uh, the Julian Theron case. Uh, she came to the hospital, um, you know, suspected of COVID-19, but she was pregnant, moving between hospitals, she suffered um, significant loss of blood. She ended up dying very little by way of investigation, very little by way of prosecution of these matters. Uh, and so I, I get your point and I really do share it um, that unfortunately much of the focus over the years has been political rather than protecting some of the economic, social and cultural rights and, even, and civic rights of individuals um, such as the right to health. Um, Deidre, Deidre rather. Okay, sir, good morning. I agree with Candice and Serene. 
And I think the government, they don't pay attention to the sustainable development. And right. I can understand why that is because as a developing country, we tend to overuse our resources to gain favorable trade. So we're gonna Absolutely. export to first world countries so that we can gain money for our country. But they don't really pay attention to sustainable development because we give these foreign entities all these rights to basically degrade our environment and what are we gonna have left in the future. Ladies, it seems as if Jason got kicked out of the meeting. Sorry, that should be Dr. Haynes. Yes, my apologies. I think um, Deidre was speaking a while ago. And the last thing I heard, and I do apologize for the internet problems, um, was that uh, sustainable development has not been a priority for uh, developing countries, including Jamaica. Uh, the point I think that you were making was that oftentimes our interests, our environmental interests in particular, our trading um, or, or our, you know, our ability to survive as a country is often sacrificed um, for the need for improved trade within our jurisdictions, um, have foreign investors come in. Uh, many of them may destroy the environment through establishing um, their companies, which don't respect environmental laws, rules and regulations, and so forth. Um, so um, did, I, did I miss much um, else uh, there, Deidre? No, that's it, sir. All right, then, excellent. Very good point. Uh, that that means, Elliot, Kristen also had a point. Is there? Yes, sir, good morning. Yes, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, please. So I was thinking of um, access to secondary education. Although that yes. is a right, it's not really enforced. And there are a lot of um, young right. people who they'll leave school at a young age and there's nothing really done about that. So that's the one that came to mind. There's nothing really done about that. So that's the one that yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Jamaica's Charter on Fundamental Rights and Freedoms interestingly mentions the right to education, but it mentions it in the context, as you've rightly identified, of primary education as being an implicit right, or rather an explicit right. Um, but it doesn't mention beyond primary school, the right to secondary education. And what we've seen, I mean, I lived in Jamaica for two years and I worked at the university there um, at Mona and went to law school there, um, was that on a regular day, if you're going down to Sovereign, if you're going down to half a tree um, and passing many other quarters in that region, you have a significant number of what we consider to be barrel children um, who are uh, serving as window wipers, um, who are cleaning uh, vehicles that are passing by, who are begging on the streets. And the truth is, as much as the government is in a bind at the moment, especially given COVID-19. The reality is there is not as much effort placed on reintegrating these individuals into the secondary school system or even in the primary school system, because I'm sure many of them haven't even graduated primary school. So we have, as you've rightly identified, a gap, and it's a significant gap in the system of education in which your resources, the amount of resources that you have have a direct bearing on your progress as an individual beyond primary school. The fewer resources that you have, the lesser your familial and parental support system is, or the weaker it is, I should say, um, the more likely it is that you will end up um, on the streets, that you will be subject to violence, discrimination, and various other types of harm. So you're absolutely right in saying that we need to move in the direction of recognizing fully, not just the right to primary education, but also I think secondary education um, in constitution, but also more generally speaking as a matter of practice. So that is the position with respect to those people who um, refer to themselves as natural rights theorists and how they conceive of social justice. 
Then you have welfare theorists or people who believe in a welfare system. Now, these people talk about distribution of justice or distributive justice, as they refer to it, where you share the wealth around. They speak about this notion of there being a shared contract between the state and the individuals, that if the individuals elect particular parties and ministers of government to office, that the expectation is that the government will look out for their interests, especially the interests of vulnerable populations, so as to ensure that they get the necessary resources that they need, the sort of food, the clothing, the shelter, and other types of relief. Now, they speak in large part about society having marginalized groups, disadvantaged groups, individuals who are not in a position to themselves obtain certain benefits. And as a result, the state has to intervene by setting up welfare systems in place so as to assist these individuals. This welfare type system may include the provision of food, clothing, and shelter through, in, which in many jurisdictions is called poor relief. Um, in other cases, they argue that individuals who don't necessarily have the requisite credentials um, should still be allowed certain opportunities um, to engage in work. They speak about providing housing for individuals who are disadvantaged, individuals, especially mothers with many children um, who are not in a position to take care of those children. She should be provided with not only social support, but also housing. And it talks about providing unemployment benefits for individuals who are not working, who are not either in a position to do so because they don't have the requisite education or training, or they have been put out of work, for example, because of COVID-19 and other related problems that confront society. But there are challenges associated with creating a welfare system. And I just want to hear from you in terms of what do you think are some challenges that can be created if you have a free fall system. So you create a welfare system in which people who are in need um, come to relevant government departments, they get what they want, they get housing, they get clothing, they get food, they get resources that they need, and they have to worry very little about what the future looks like because the government is providing all of their resources. Yes, Deidre? Sir, I think that can create a kind of societal stagnant because yes. nobody has any goals, nobody has anything to look forward to because they develop this kind of dependence on a government entity like a parent and a child. So there's no maturity, there's no drive. And I think that can have significant developmental effects. Absolutely, excellent. And there's a particular term to describe in particular what you've just, um, just mentioned, and I'll mention it a while from now. Yes, uh, Candice? Okay, um, I think that if you have it around for long enough, people are just going to figure out ways to take advantage of the system, to cheat the system, to get a little extra more, even though it's supposed to be a fair um, spread across the population. So I think that could also be a thing, whether it be um, taking advantage yes, of it from absolutely. the participants' yeah. point uh, of so view. So the point that both you and Deidre are making is, is an important one. Um, They don't have to work hard. They don't have to discipline themselves. They don't have to take opportunities that come their way. You would end up having a welfare dependent system in which everybody comes to um, the ministries, Ministry of Social Development, seeking assistance. And they would not be incentivized, I think, to take the necessary steps to educate themselves, to find a job, to be ambitious. Now, the implications of that are many. So the persons who are going to bear the tax burden, because somebody has to pay for this welfare society, would it be those people who have educated themselves, those people who are working in pretty good jobs and earning a good salary, they would be taxed in an inordinate way. And therefore, they will end up having to bear the brunt Of the responsibility for caring for individuals who may not even care for their own well-being. And so there is a tension, there is a significant argument which exists at the moment between those who hold the view that 
yes, we can provide for some of the needs of individuals, but we should have a broad-based system, a free-for-all system, because that's going to create what Candice and Deidre describe as the welfare dependency system. Um, and, and of course, those who maintain very strongly that it is part of the social contract that has been created, that individuals in the society have elected their governments for the purposes of meeting their needs. And to the extent that the governments don't meet their needs, the government is not fulfilling the, their responsibility, their obligations on that particular contract. Then of course, you have those who adopt the mutual advantage approach. Now they stress this idea of self-reliance. They argue that self-reliance must be nurtured, it must be encouraged, it must be supported. Their view is that things should be based on merit. Individuals shouldn't just be coming to a system because they're poor and or disadvantaged and be able to benefit from the, 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 the opportunities that are created there by the government. That these individuals must demonstrate at least an interest at least There is some degree of commitment to getting better, doing better than where they are currently in life. And that if that individual or individuals demonstrate that commitment and that willingness to do better, then you give them the tools that they need to do better. So for example, if an individual is disadvantaged educationally, wants a good job, et cetera, then instead of just providing that individual on a monthly basis or a weekly basis, with the financial resources to be able to take care of their needs, what you can simply do is to afford this individual the opportunity to be able um, to get education. So you pay for their school fees, you pay for their book loan scheme, et cetera, so that you place that individual in a position to be able to um, advance their education and then following from advancing their education, they will get a job and then the job is going to lead to um, them being able to be more self-reliant than if you just provide for them on a consistent basis in keeping with the welfare system. So that is the approach that is countenance um, by those people who believe in this notion of mutual advantage, all right? Um, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts in terms of your preference. Um, do you prefer the natural rights argument about human rights? The state must respect and protect human rights at all costs. Do you prefer the idea of the welfare system or do you prefer the system of mutual advantage? Um, what is your thought on, on, on that particular question? Any thoughts about which is better? which is worse, which we should discard, which should we, we should respect or credit. Uh, yes, Sri? Well, I agree with the mutual advantage system because you know it's mutual and everyone can put their own work in to get, get what they deserve out. The welfare system, I also agree with it to an extent I think right now it's a bit too concentrated, but I think that's also because of the rate of poverty in our society. So it's kind right. of we can't we can't get rid of it unless we 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 elevate the mentality of people because it's the mentality really that's keeping them in a certain place. So mm -hmm. I agree, kind of agree with all three, but just to an extent. Right. I think right now it's a bit too concentrated. Okay, fair enough. So your view then is that all of them have their merits, um, their advantages, and some of them, in, all of them really kind of make sense in their own way. But then you think that the welfare system is just a bit too much, um, that there is greater need for individuals to be more, um, to be more committed, to be more innovative, opportunities um, to hustle even um, if, if that becomes necessary. All right. So we're going to move on very briefly. 
All right. So Joanna's view is that mutual advantage is good because everyone benefits and grows, which leads to increased development in the country. And that's a really good point as well, that it is reciprocal. Um, everyone has an opportunity to be educated. Um, if you, you want, if, if you want to get out of poverty, then you take the long way where you seek education, then you seek employment thereafter. Then of course you have resources to get yourself out of poverty. All right. Okay. So we move on now to this notion of discrimination and prejudice. Now we know as we've lived in Caribbean society um, for very many years, and certainly those of you who've been born in Jamaica or grew up in Jamaica know that discrimination prejudice is rife in Jamaica. Now, Caribbean societies, they're no stranger to discrimination and prejudice from the very outset, from sense colonialism, from sense conquest, from sense the plantation system, we have been at a disadvantage. We've suffered from discrimination. We've been treated less favorably compared to our counterparts. We've been subject to prejudice um, in many ways. Now, when we talk about discrimination, prejudice, and stereotype, we're really truly really talking about the same thing, but from different lenses. So they technically have different definitions as such, um, but nonetheless, they relate to the fact that individuals are treated less favorably than they deserve to be treated, all right? So when we talk about prejudice, we're talking about attitudes that people have. Attitudes that treat individuals or rather see some individuals as being inferior, whereas some individuals as being superior, all right? So we may have certain prejudgments value judgments about individuals based on their skin color, based on where they're from in Jamaica, the uptown versus downtown approach. That is very evident and who were from uptown, who are from downtown. Ladies, it seems as if Jason got kicked, Dr. Haynes, I should say, uh, got kicked off again. So let us see if he could, if he's going to rejoin. Uh, I do apologize, my internet is really uh, bad. Um, as you can imagine, everybody's home these days. And so it invariably places this pressure on the bandwidth. Um, but just before I was cut off, the point I was making is that, that when we talk about prejudice, we're talking about attitudes towards certain people in which we view them without knowing very much about them as either superior or inferior. Oftentimes, prejudices are negative. So we may view somebody who is um, very dark skin in a particular way. We may view somebody who is from an inner city community in a particular way, um, which is usually negative. Without first meeting, understanding that person's situation, uh, discussing with that person what their lived experiences are, uh, we come to a conclusion about who they are and their value system based simply on our own prejudice. Uh, the idea that we somehow know much more than um, we do um, and in reality, uh, simply because of a general practice or general trend or general view of who these individuals are and what they're about. Then we have stereotypes. These are very rigid ideas about particular groups of people. So they, for example, may treat or view, let's say, 
Black people don't really have a knack for business. That is a stereotype. There are many successful Black people. They may also say that Indians hoard money. So they don't spend a lot. Um, they save a lot for the future and for their uh, future descendants. That is a stereotypical view. It might be true in some instances, but it is not, it is not definitive of all situations involving Indian nationals. The Indians who don't hold money, who spend very liberally, who give to generous causes, who are engaged in philanthropic exercises. Many people take the view, which is stereotypical, that persons of Chinese descent may gamble or they may not be prepared to pay individuals certain um, resources or wages that they deserve. Again, that treats an entire class particular trait is fixed and in every situation that particular group identifies with that particular trait. And in reality, there are exceptions. There are, um, there are sort of diversions from that normal in every particular group from that trait, in other words, that you identify an individual as part of that group as having. All right, so it is important that we become conscious of what those traits are and we address them. And as you grow further along in your academic pursuit, as you think about university, as you think about heading into the workplace, it's important that you throw off those prejudices and stereotypes that you may have had, because in that way, you're better able to deal with people for who they are based on your experience and your encounter with them, rather than having a prejudgment as to what these individuals may very well be based on notions related to their race, or their class or gender, as the case may be, all right? Now, where do we develop these stereotypes? Now, oftentimes you don't even know. We don't even appreciate the fact that we are stereotyping women, or fellow women, and, and most of you, are, well, all of you here, with the of the all, are females. You have stereotypes and So it's really important that you understand the origins of um, these stereotypes. You understand the origins of these prejudices because they can land you into conflict. They can damage relationships. Um, and oftentimes they are bred in the family, in the family home, in our socialization with our fellow um, colleagues, people who look like us, people who speak like us. We develop these prejudices and stereotypes. And we don't think outside of the box because we've accustomed or been accustomed to hearing the same thing about particular groups in society. Um, and so we need to be very aware of them. So we have a prejudice, for example, against other Caribbean nationals. So based on accents, something as simple as an accent, we may be prejudiced toward them prejudice toward Haitians because there have been many stories in the media that Haitians um, tend to leave their country and go elsewhere seeking opportunities. Guyanese, because Guyanese similarly exercise their agency seeking opportunities abroad. Or simply the fact that I have a different accent from you. Although I think my accent is pretty similar, you may very well see me as the other, the outsider, even though I may very well share many striking similarities with you and similar value systems, even though I'm from another country or share different accent as the case may be. 
So it's really important that we understand what these prejudices are and that we confront them appropriately. Now, when we talk of discrimination, we talk about the actual treatment of individuals. We talk about these individuals because of their race, because of their sex, because of their um, nationality, because of their class, because of their creed, they're treated lesser or less favorably compared to you or somebody else, all right? So in other words, when we talk about discrimination, we are looking at a comparison between how one set of persons who fit into a particular class or particular group are treated compared to the others, especially if they're similarly placed, we ask ourselves, has this group of individuals on account of, let's say, their race, been treated less favorably compared to this group of individuals who share a different race? If so, then that is a prima facie or on the face of it case of discrimination. And you can discriminate on many grounds, as we will learn in a while from now. It can be age, it can be sex, it can be class, it can be uh, creed, so religion, among other things. There's several areas and are the ways in which persons have been discriminated over the years or the ways in which persons can be discriminated. So persons can be discriminated on the basis of their age. So we know that in our society that men, sorry, that, that uh, older persons are typically treated not very nice. In many instances, all the people are viewed as mischievous. They're viewed as sick, infirm, lacking mental faculties, depressed even, evil, disrespectful, etc. And in many instances, family members even don't have a problem with simply um, discarding these individuals, putting them in an old uh, elderly home. Um, and so we have a society which has become less and less conscious of the needs of the concerns of persons who are older. Now, these individuals are often viewed as society's outcasts. They've served their time, they're on their deathbed, and therefore the time is ripe for us to distance ourselves from these individuals. Now, similarly, on the other end of the spectrum, children are often regarded as property. They're regarded as the family's um, property. They are told what to do, when to do. They're treated as objects rather than subjects as such. They can be spoken to, but they're not given the opportunity in many instances to speak. Many of them suffer verbal abuse, physical abuse at the hands of parents, family members, society more generally speaking. And so we have a situation in which on the basis of your age alone, you can be subject to certain disadvantages which other groups of persons are not subject to. Young people are regarded as vulgar. That's a prejudice, it's a perception. And oftentimes they may be discriminated against. In other words, they might be treated less favorably compared to others because they don't fit into the dominant stereotype. So the dominant stereotype is that you must be proper, that you must speak well at all times in standard English, that you must um, be you know, fully involved in Christian or church related activities, that you shouldn't drink alcohol, that you shouldn't smoke, that you shouldn't have bizarre hair dresses, um, um, hair sort of um, textures um, or dress codes. Um, et cetera, et cetera. No, not everybody fits into these dominant um, prescriptions. And for those people who, for example, love dance hall music and who revel in it, they are viewed in some ways as outcast. They're disadvantaged in one way or another. Now, people have various choices. People have the choice to be tattooed up. People have a choice to uh, wear multiple earrings as they please. But in a professional context, 
they may very well be subject to restrictions in terms of their ability to be employed on the basis of what is immediately evident, i.e. the tattoos and so forth, which uh, employers may not view in a credible way. And so across various spectra, in other words, we see ageism demonstrated. The fact that by virtue of falling into certain categories, whether the elderly, whether children, whether as young people, you are subject to certain disadvantages that others are not subject to. Now, many elderly people in the Caribbean context and certainly in the Jamaican context are viewed in very prejudicial ways. They are viewed as homebound. We have the media talking about them being grouchy and evil and noisy. We have a healthcare system which is inadequate to deal with these individuals and their myriad needs. We have there being a reluctance, generally speaking, to hire people who are much older. And interestingly, people are required to retire at the age of 65. In some countries, actually, you're required to retire at 60. And for many people, some of you whose parents are in the 60s, you would appreciate that these individuals have not given their all as yet, but they are forced to retire because of prejudicial systems, discriminatory systems in place, which prevent these individuals from working beyond a certain age. So very quickly, your thoughts. Do you think ageism is a real issue in Jamaica? Is ageism a real issue in Jamaica? Have you seen elements of it? Or is it something that we've just contrived, we've thought about, it's academic, it's not really a practical issue that is faced? Any thoughts there? Uh, yes, Suri? And then we'll hear from Christian. Yes, go ahead, please, Suri. Yes, sir, I agree with ageism because my grandma, she, when she retired, she was still young and strong. <laughs> And she could have still worked. And I don't agree with letting them just rot away because doing that affects them mentally because they'll say, oh, I'm just on my way to my deathbed now. It, it, it removes a purpose to live because a lot of them Absolutely. at that age, they've been working in the field for all those years and to just be cut off like that without any reason just that you should retire, it really affects them and it causes them, I feel like it causes them to die earlier sometimes, you know? True, absolutely. Very good point there, Serene. Um, yes, Christian, go ahead, please. Yes, sir. So I agree with what Serene said, and I'm sure many of us will admit that we have faced many miserable old people. Um, a lot of elders can be, but I think a reason for that is because they don't have much to do and they still have a lot of energy, right? And they still have a lot to potentially bring to society, to the economy. I believe that um, elders could actually, their values and traditions could be used to maintain our cultural values. They could teach younger people because we do face in certain areas of our culture the potential for cultural erasure, but elders would be yes. a part of that cultural retention. And just teaching us basic skills that many people may not value anymore that could come in handy later on in life. I think they still have a lot to give, but we're, as a society, yeah. we're not willing to accept that. Absolutely. I very much agree with you, uh, Kristen. Very elegant. Uh, Candice. Okay, um, in the case of children, I definitely agree that ageism is a thing because yes, I do understand that children may not know everything that is out there, hence their parents are supposed to speak on their behalf. However, I don't think that the child voice is valued as much or is considered because as far as they're concerned, we're born yesterday. But just because I was born yesterday doesn't mean I haven't figured out anything as far as now. So I think it's definitely a thing where the child opinion is not, it isn't, it isn't valued. Take, for instance, even in the case of when we're picking our seasick and cape subjects, 
we're not allowed to pick certain subjects because all oh, the parents feel like it's a waste of time. You should do accounts because you know you have a guaranteed job. And yeah. the child does not like working with numbers, but those those things are not taken into account because I'm not really sure why, but you, you get my point. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I very much agree with you. I think it's a, a very sound argument. Um, that children are still treated as property. They're, they're still recognized as objects. Um, they're not subjects as such. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's very little by way um, of engagement. Um, I realize that we've run out of time, right? So I, I do apologize for that. Um, Mr. Wall, <clears throat> thank you very much again for, for having me. Um, you know, it's it was a really good class, very good discussion. Loved hearing from you. Um, hopefully, <clears throat> some of you do law, um, and some of you uh, join me at KFL. Um, we will continue the discussion about social justice issues, among other things. Um, so, thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure hearing from you. And I wish you all the very best in your examinations that are upcoming. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Haynes. Uh, is, is it Shereen or Sanchez? Oh, sir, I'm here, Shereen. Go ahead for me, Shereen. Thank you very much, Mr. Haynes, for your wonderful presentation. You have educated us not only as Caribbean City students, but as humans and as Caribbean people in general about social justice. And I know a lot of us are planning to go into the field of law or social sciences and this presentation was well thought out filled with exceptional information and i really appreciate it because you really opened my eyes to some social injustices and it's really broadened my spectrum of things so thank you very, very much sir have a wonderful day all right uh, thank you so much, Serene, and thank you all for uh, participating. It was a really all right, ladies. It would I would have liked if we would have finished the discussion uh, on discrimination because that's a very good discussion coming up. Uh, and I know that Dr. Haynes would have delved deeper into the discussion on uh, things like discrimination when it comes to sexual orientation uh, and different access within the society. And therefore, when we meet in our individual classes, our teachers will take up those discussions. Either they can continue from what uh, Dr. Haynes left off, or we they could also go through the entire stuff on topic on social justice. Dr. Haynes, you are still here? And I reinforce, ladies, when you go to university next year, if a lecturer has a PhD, please refer to them by their title. Doctor, they have worked very hard for their title. All right, ladies, enjoy the rest of the morning. See you on Thursday face to face for my grade 13. Hi, sir. Okay, sir. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.